Disgruntled workers of the Cameroon Airlines Corporation, Cameco, have today staged a strike action demanding the payment of their benefits as well as salaries owed to them by the company. They had a meeting today with officials of the regional delegation for labor and social security. Josephine Binzi will be telling us more on that. Cameroonians trapped in India are begging government to come to their aid. For the past five months, life has been precarious, uh, far away from home. We shall be hearing from Michelle Bissek, who tells us more on how life has become extremely difficult for Cameroonians who have been trapped as a result of COVID-19. And with barely three days to the Feast of Sacrifice, the sale of the ram, which is the principal element of that festivity, remains uh, timid in the economic capital Douala. Readers remain hopeful that business will steam up as the days draw closer. Christian Asex Rele has more on that. Those are top stories. Good evening and thanks for joining us. You're watching the primetime newscast on STV. Just as we told you in the headlines, disgruntled workers of the Cameroon Airlines Corporation Cameco today staged a strike action demanding the payment of their benefits as well as salaries owed to them by the company. Before officials of the Regional Delegation for Labor and Social Security, they also decry the absence of health insurance. Josephine Binzi has more. There is hope for satisfaction with monthly financial benefits of Cameco workers, retirement benefits, and health insurance as dissatisfied Cameco employees express their grievances this morning over delayed salary payments. For it will have come from the same place, but I'm here defending my rights for all the money Cameco has to pay me. Some people are 33 years old and haven't been paid, but I presume that has to do with the coffers. Here I'm requesting for my retirement allowance, which has to be given me. They had problems with the coffers, which is not my business. All I want is my money. How do they think I've been surviving six months? Six months. Six, six months si. Vous pensez que je vis comment? Depuis sept mois? The International Transport Workers Federation was present to back the action of their disgruntled colleagues. It is in support of our colleagues working with Kameku, who are all affiliates of the International Transport Workers Federation. We are here today to call upon our authorities to make sure that the problem posed by the workers of Cameco finds a solution as soon as possible. This, however, syndicates say, is a journey of no return as they intend pressing forth for answers till their expectations are met. Uh, the workers are not satisfied because the company uh, don't give the appropriate uh, solution to the conflict. So we cannot uh, turn back because we have to um, receive all what we need. So we are going to continue our fight and we are going to ask the government to help the company and help workers by paying them their salaries and health insurance. This took place at exactly 10 a.m. today, July 28, 2020, at the Delegation of Labor and Social Security in the Littoral Region as they look forth to a tangible solution in the days ahead. The founder of the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa has appealed to the population of the Northwest and Southwest regions for them to join in the success of the presidential plan to reconstruct and develop the two restive regions. Barrister Felix Nkongo Agbobala, who was guest on the program Hot Talk on STV, says that it would be unwise to strike against the plan when people are suffering as a result of clashes between government forces and separatists in the two English-speaking regions. Let's listen to him. 
the presidential plan for reconstruction and, and development you know everything has been politicized and um, it's now we against them or they against us so people look at things from different perspectives probably if you just said a recovery plan nobody would be questioning it you understand so it's 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 also a problem and let's not pretend you know the name makes it um, more difficult for people to accept it but from my own personal perspective i, I would look at it as a point of view of recovery you understand mm -hmm. and um, a lot of people have said that how can there be recovery when the conflict when is the going conflict on? is going I on. said no yeah. we, we've seen instances where the UN gets there to do recovery while the conflict is going on you don't know when the conflict will come to an end for the conflict to come the conflict to come to an end it doesn't depend on one individual okay it depends on many stakeholders and as we speak the stakeholders are not really prepared to 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 have a concrete solution so whilst they are preparing to get to a solution what is happening to the people? The people are suffering. The people want to get back to normalcy. So how do we have a stopgap measure during this phase where the conflict is still going on for the people to get some form of normalcy? I can give you a, a very practical example. Take Boya. Prior to the crisis, let's assume that Boya had 200 persons, not so 200,000. And during the, he the height of the crisis, people like 30,000 left. Now, Boya has like 250 because the Ekunas and the Munyenges, they have come to Boya. Boya. Not so. There's a need to be hospitals, for example. There's a need to be schools, not so. Other facilities. How, what do we do during this period? So we look at the places which are kind of safe and start doing something. Because if the conflict finishes today, you cannot do reconstruction within the next one year. It will be a long phase, not so. So start where it's, 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 it's feasible and look at the people. The interest, the, the government owes a duty to protect people's lives and their property. And their property. So government has to do what it's supposed to do. But also to my brothers and sisters in the separatist movement or those who are saying no, think about the people. When you meet somebody, I went to refugee camp in Nigeria and asked some people, you know, there are problems. Why are they not coming back? A couple of years ago, and they said they cannot come back because they don't have anywhere to stay. Okay? We complain when government burned these villages, not so. We issued statements criticizing government. Government wants to rebuild the same villages, and we say no. You understand? So what do we really want? Let's be honest also, because most of the people who are saying no are not the people who are the victims. Okay? Talk to somebody. I, I mean, I, I talk to a myriad of people daily. People call, send messages. If I show you my personal messages on WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook, people are crying. People are suffering. You know, we, our people have never been beggars. But the crisis has made our people beggars. So how do we find a solution to get back to normalcy? And most people don't understand that UNDP is going to be the implementing partner. And... UNDP is not politicizing the recovery. So we need to give them an opportunity in some of the places which are safe. You know, if schools have been burned in a place where two years ago it wasn't safe and today is safe, don't we need to rebuild those schools to recover what it has so that kids should be able to go back to school? Cameroonians stuck in India are uh, asking the government for help. Life in the past five months, they lament, has been precarious since uh, the borders were closed as a result of uh, COVID-19. Let's now listen to, um, to Michel Bissek. He is one of the Cameroonians trapped in the New Delhi in India. He spoke to Josephine Bizzi. Yeah. Staying in a lockdown in India since the 17th of May. And since that day, that day, we are not able to go out to find what we can eat. We are not able to rent hotel because all hotels are closed. We are in some guest house when we leave. And till the 24th of May also, we are obliged to stay alone in the room, closed. We cannot go out because everywhere is locked down. In uh, May, in May, we began to contact the government to try to bring all communions back because to take the, to contact contact all communions was very difficult, and we sent the message in Cameroon to give our numbers, our phone numbers to the family who are in India, and since the two of May, we began to collect information and. We send the information in Cameroon Embassy in China and in the uh, Ministry of External Relations in Cameroon.
So until now, we don't have an official response. Uh, we received last week the list of all communal who are authorized to take the plane will be uh, arranged, with, the charter will be arranged by Cameroon government. But until now, we don't have official information. What I can tell you that we are 109 five dead and two uh, uh, have been cremated because they don't have uh, uh, money to in the matter, yes. So they, they have been cremated. We are now 104 and three cops who are waiting for the charter to go back home. But it's become very difficult because we don't have money to, to rent the hotel then hotels are closed. We don't have money to, to go and take something to eat. Some ONG just come and help us. That is the situation here in India. The Prime Minister, head of government, weeks back announced the reopening of specialized screening centers for COVID-19. But some inhabitants of the economic capital, Douala, have acknowledged that they do not go in for the COVID-19 screening at the specialized centers due to their location. Uh, to them, the long distance constitutes a, a major impediment in their quest to know their status. Katran Kone has more. The creation of a decentralized screening centers for coronavirus is now a reality in Cameroon. But its effectiveness will be determined if Cameroonians go for testing so as to know their COVID-19 status. Approaching some inhabitants in Douala to know if they have taken the coronavirus test, they say, I have never done the test because it has not been imposed on me. But the day they do, I will take the test without hesitating. For now, I have not done the test to be asking for 15,000 pounds. And I don't have 15,000 pounds to go to the hospital. I don't even know how to do it. To others, the location of some of the centers is a big threat. If the team were closer to us, I think I would have done the test. I come here early for work and I go back very late in the evening. If the team were there, we would have definitely taken the test. Voilà. No, but if there was a team here, we would have definitely done it. The health minister has launched a mobile car event in Yaoundé for COVID-19 screening as an extension of the treaty strategy, track, test and treat. The locals of Douala are hoping it could be extended in Douala in order to facilitate the screening process. Now, the World Health Organization has donated 10,000 face masks and 4,000 uh, gloves to the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Douala. 5,000 face masks and three thermal flashes were equally donated to the nursing department of that faculty. Officials say it is part of the WHO's efforts to fight the spread of COVID-19 in Cameroon. And donations to the blind and visually impaired uh, persons of the training center for, for productivity of blind and visually impaired of uh, Bonaberry, Cameroon, by Gabriel Fonja, Member of Parliament, uh, was done uh, today, July 28, 2020. Engaged in the intellectual development and enhancement of youth, the initiator intends to reinforce the fight against literacy, help and accompany the underprivileged through trainings, employment, as well as reinforce the fight against juvenile delinquency and deviances in the school milieu. Candidates sitting in for the BPC examination have today entered the two of the exercise. As our reporter Katrin Kone tells us, COVID-19 barrier measures were strictly respected before and during the writing session. Her report. Taking of temperature, composure wearing of face mask, and inspecting of student rising materials are the first move carried out by teachers of Government Balingo High School, New Bell, as candidates of Bay APC of the French Subsystem of Education, enter day two of the examination. Uh, we, uh, GBHS New Bell uh, Subcenter for the Bay APC, we are writing in. Uh, uh, 33 
uh, halls with uh, each of the halls containing 24 candidates. The rest of the multiplication can be done to know the number of candidates that are actually in the center. Uh, this morning, the, the gate was open at 6.30 for candidates to come in. And, uh, you know, we are at the level of Trasium. Trasium, the children are very, still very young and uh, uh, they have a number of difficulties, some dragging their feet and so on. But we are very fortunate this morning that uh, it didn't rain. So most of them, uh, they came on time. Even though a few, a few as usual, forgot their face masks, but uh, they were very fortunate that we have a reserve stock of face masks in school that we give to those who forgot theirs. After gaining access into the school campus, the washing of hands and social distancing in classes were inevitable. Uh, other preventive measures against the COVID-19, which is the, uh, the major fight of uh, the government and all its institutions now. Uh, we have water points where the students uh, they wash their hands. Each, student, or each candidate is expected to come in with a face mask, that was verified. Distancing measures have been respected because in each of the writing halls, there are 24 candidates, each candidate sitting on its uh, desk. And uh, uh, the examination authorities have made it possible for the candidates to, to sit in a zigzag manner so that no one has a direct contact of less than uh, one meter from the other candidates. The examination restarted all over the country with oral communication is expected to continue tomorrow. Rehabilitation works have begun on some sections of the Mbopi market destroyed by an inferno uh, at the end of uh, last year, precisely November 2019. The traders have saluted the development and are hoping for better days. Our reporter Josephine Binzi went to the market and spoke to some traders. Her report. The latest fire outbreak is barely nine months as Mashimbopi, the Center for Electronic Purchase, went up in flames with some businessmen recording huge losses. It has been a battle to gather the broken pieces of this incident, as businessmen explain. In the month of November, I was at home and received a call that my shop was on fire and I was in deep shock and upon arrival the fire had swallowed my shop. The peculiarity of the market is that it has never been constructed as a fire incident could do a great damage in a very short period of time. I wasn't fortunate to save anything because I came late and the little I gathered was all stolen by thieves. I'm still struggling to stand back to my feet while waiting for my shop space to be reconstructed. Some sellers attest to the difficult moments they went through, but the toughest will be the reconstruction of the burnt sector as over 20 shops were burnt. It's hard to sell what we had in our shops during the fire outbreak because most of them were damaged. Standing back to our feet is really tough as I think it's hard too for authorities to construct the site right behind me. We lost accessory of close to one billion as there were over 23 shops that got burnt. Nineteenth of November was the date of the last fire outbreak in this market, which is home to millions of electronic transactions in Douala. Most traders are still positive as the construction of shop space has begun. On to the last of our top stories. As preparations towards the Muslim Feast of Sacrifice hits up in the economic capital Douala, the sale of the ram, which is an essential part of that festivity, is, is timid in markets in Douala. Breathers are, however, hopeful that business will pick up steam by Friday, July 31, the day of the feast. Details with Christelle Asexuele. 
As preparations amplify ahead of the Feast of the Ram, headsmen and breeders of livestock are revitalizing ahead of the feast. As a result, sheep prices increase as Muslim faithfuls and traders start purchasing them ahead of the Eid al -Adha. Hassan, a headsman from the north, has this to say. Uh, asking, but uh, the market started it uh, yesterday and it's going gradually. Okay. Yes. We are selling in categories. 50,000, 70, 60, some of them 100, if you have equality. Nonetheless, the traders and their clients always find a common ground to settle on. We have uh, the one from Chad, the one from uh, Northwest region in Bamenda, the one from uh, other people who are selling those, they are calling, um, how do they call it, uh, Uda. Yes. Many breeders and heeders like Hassan face difficulties traveling with these animals as they lack places to sleep and graze their livestock, a situation he further explains. We are facing a problem of um, we don't have a place to, to sleep with our animal and to graze with them. Yes. This festival, which will be celebrated throughout the Muslim world on Friday, July 31, 2020, commemorates Abraham's willingness to sacrifice everything to God. Two children have died in the Kosala neighborhood in Kumba, Mehmet Division of the Southwest Region. The children Christopher, four years, and Patrick, two, uh, died uh, today, Tuesday, July 28, under mysterious circumstances. According to eyewitness accounts, the children died after, after consuming a plate of Irish potatoes at home. However, investigations have been open to know the exact cause of the deaths. Let's now have um, the reaction. Uh, for the grieving mother, Christine Ashamo, who spoke to our reporter. No, not to happen because I've been on the market. But uh, I'm waiting for Mama Nito. He said he woke up and smoked one tea, one chop, eat the Irish potatoes. The Irish potatoes, now for us, we cook yesterday. So now the main one, they give the picking chop. As a finished chop now, we go now for Makoko, we come from the front, that other side. After this street, the next street, we will be the play. We will come out and go for OBS, we will send money for my small brother, we will buy money. They remember I say my small sister or my first daughter. So they, they begin to start crying for that compound, for that side now. Never come on and ask and say, how they begin to over cry so? The big sister, the big sister come now, the baba is the car house. So as the big sister, the baba is the car house now, he run now, go back for my cousin, for they say me they give my phone number. My cousin asked him, he said, they picking the shake. Picking the shake. My cousin said, that means don't make it on vex, don't over cry, me they go bring the picking. Before my cousin will run from their own house, come now, mommy they come back. He met my, my last born for, for years, he said, very the shake. Mommy carry the picking and take him for the picking and he won't look at him. The picking don't give up. So the wrong can come in for market. I come back now for market. They for you would cry. That other one, they no bring it. The big one now, they leave it for my uncle. He come for me before the men who come for you. As so they would cry one sinner, they start her like again for that side. They don't carry that one. Can I so form they come up with mob. Say so you don't start agitate yourself again. They bring it now for you. I see be still be alive now. We we'll leave that one way on that we'll go now hospital. General hospital. We'll go reach now hospital. Now we'll they outside. They take that big one enter. Then doctor comments me they bring the the one way we do it that we we'll a cover as they bring all the picking. After some time now doctor say all the two picking around that see me they bring them back for house. Out of the country, as businesses start to reopen in the United States, some people are turning to technology in a bid to figure out how to make workplaces safer. We have details with the VOA. Before the pandemic, this sensor mounted over a door had one job. Let building managers know how office space, bathrooms, cafeterias, were being used. Now that information is helping companies figure out how to make workplaces safe. There's a, a, a sensor that gets mounted above a point of entry and as people enter and exit we use infrared laser light 
and uh, a whole bunch of really cool algorithms to both generate and analyze depth data. And that depth data gives us a really clear understanding of how many people enter and exit a space. Companies are turning to technology like this as they try to figure out how to get people safely back to work. Drones that monitor from the air, social distancing, and face mask wearing. Wearable devices that buzz when employees are too close for too long. The pandemic has accelerated employers' experimentation with tech in the workplace. We really need new experimentation, especially around worker health and safety. Um, but we have to be, we have to tread really carefully here because uh, otherwise we could risk institutionalizing things, ha have negative consequences for workers in their workplaces. One of those potential consequences, increased surveillance of employees that erodes their sense of privacy. Unlike cameras inside workplaces, density sensor doesn't identify individuals. There's a fine line there, and you can still maintain people's safety without removing their privacy. Density works with companies, universities, and other organizations to prevent too many people pulling in one place. When maybe a, a bathroom is full and people shouldn't go in there yet, um, or things like elevator lobbies or places where people tend to congregate. Technology as gatekeeper. It may be a trade-off many will come to accept. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, San Francisco. And that caps this edition of the Primetime Newscast on STV. Thank you very much for watching. More news comes up at 8 p.m. in the French language. From us, it's good night. Bye-bye.